Hey everybody, this is Rustin with Metalholic and Axis Entertainment. With us today, John Gallagher of Raven. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing great, Rustin. Great to be here. It's been sort of a strange week for you. Bus troubles coming into oh. Boise. Yeah, and that's very true. It's been a, a bit of a trial. That's really the first gig we've missed in probably 25, 30 years. Go figure, it's probably about the only time you've ever been in Boise, and I had to miss out. So. <laughs> oh, boy, I'm sorry about that. Uh, hopefully we'll make it up next year or something, you know? Yeah, hopefully we'll get a chance to get you out here again. But anyway, you know, I wanted to touch base, because you guys, you guys have a lot of stuff going on right now on top of the tour. Oh, yeah. But, but first, I mean... Very true. 40 years, it's hard to imagine 40 years of, of, you know, working in Raven and doing all the stuff you've been doing. I mean, hell, the Beatles and Zeppelin combined only made it half that long. How do you put four decades of Raven in perspective? Uh, well, it's kind of hard. It's, you know, it's like anything that's marathonic in nature. It's literally one step at a time. If someone had told me that when we were starting to play guitar, that you know, you know, still be doing this. Part of me would have said, no way. And the other part would have said, of course. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, that was the grip of uh, once we started playing instruments. To me, it was uh, all encompassing, you know. Right. It was like, this is something I'm going to be doing forever. So it's, it's humbling, definitely humbling, because, uh, you know, from our background and from where we come from, to be able to still be out there doing what we do, we're very, very, very lucky. And we really appreciate the whole the whole deal, you know. Well, and to sort of show that appreciation, you guys gave the fans last year that beautiful retrospective of the history of the band, Rock Until You Drop, A Long Day's Journey. There, there's so much stuff going on in there. It's all, it's almost like I don't even need to ask you questions because you told us the entire story of the band. But, <laughs> but uh, it's pretty much all in there. I mean, that was the idea. We could have kind of dumbed it down and did the hour and a half deal or even played up the whole thing about Mark getting the accident and coming back from it because that's usually the trajectory of these movies it's like hey you know guys form band shit happens everything goes to hell and then they come back for the redemption uh, you know that kind of nonsense we kind of like glossed over that a little bit and just filled out actually just went for detail and content because that's why it's for the fans because the more you look at it the more they say oh, wow I never saw that photo or I missed that part or you know right you can't take it all in at once this, that was the idea and after all and it's chock full of, chock full of content <laughs> and you guys put a ton of stuff in there and I know your brother Mark spent hours and hours agonizing over footage and old stuff and things like that but when you guys got it all done you released it like anything else was there that moment where you're like oh shit we should have included this uh not really it was a glitch on a few of the i think the first pressing where it, it wouldn't play all the way through you had to keep going to each chapter to, to watch it which is kind of the minor thing but other than that we pretty much got everything we wanted in uh i mean the mock's basically curating all this stuff so if there is I he he makes fun of this. He's made the evil version, <laughs> <laughs> which is basically all the embarrassing outtakes from people being interviewed, saying saying nothing or or just being just just horrible or oh my god. So that's probably going to be a Christmas gift one of these years when he gets around to finishing it. <laughs> <laughs> We're here with Phil Mog of UFO. He's here to talk about Raven, and he has this to say. Who's Raven? <laughs> you know, something like that, you know. <laughs> that sounds like Phil, but that's okay. Phil, Phil is a legend, and Phil is an awesome singer in one of the best bands that ever was. When we were kids in '77, me and my brother roadied at the local hall in Newcastle to bring the equipment in just so we could get to see UFO for free. <laughs> And you know they're right. You you guys and UFO have a lot in common in the sense that you guys were these very influential bands in the scene that never quite exploded the way everybody expected you would. That you that you should have, you know. So there's there's a common connection there. Yeah, the only connection is they were drunk all the time and we weren't. So uh, <laughs> maybe they've got an excuse. And that still hasn't changed. I, I, for I mean, when it comes down to that, it's 
those are they're almost like peripheral issues it's like you know we concentrate on doing the music the best we can and putting the performance out as best we can and you know that, that that's mu- that's the music part of the music business mm-hmm. the business part is unfortunately you could take the crappiest band or crappiest artist there ever was and if you've got the machine behind them you can you know you can literally sell dirt <laughs> It's one. one of those things. Everything and anything we ever earned in this business or whatever has been purely through our own efforts. So, you know, we were the ones that said, we're going to do a DVD, and my brother put it together and we put it out, and, you know, for an example. Well, and for the first time, I believe it's the first time, you guys are sort of using the new wave of technology or what we're doing these days, crowdfunding. You guys have done a, are doing a Kickstarter campaign for the new album, Extermination, and, of course, the uh, Party Killers CD as well. Tell us a little bit about what that's like for you, because that's that's a whole new thing for you guys to be doing. I mean, we we couldn't have conceived of this 40, 30 years ago. No, no, not at all. That was a totally different thing. Obviously, you know, the, you have to adapt and improve. Uh, we have a good relationship with our record company, but budgets being what they are these days, we wanted to really up our game from the last record. The last record was great. But in order to make this one better, we had to put more work in in pre-production, more work in writing, more work in rehearsing. And all that, of course, we knew was going to eat up an awful lot more money. And say, well, what are we going to do? And says, well, let's try the crowdfunding. You know, if we let the people hear what we're working on, you know, I think people will be excited. And we've been blown away by the reaction. People are say, about time, where can I give you my money? You know, <laughs> it's, they really want to be part of what's going on. And... When we were rehearsing, we were at a place which was a studio and just said, hey, how about recording a couple of these just to see what they sound like? And we did a couple of cover tunes and it sounded awesome. We just said, oh, let's just do a full album and maybe this could be like a bonus for the Kickstarter. And it took on a life of its own. We called it Party Killers because that's been like an in-joke for years. In Germany in the 90s, we were invited to a party and we were calling out songs that were like clearing the dance floor. (laughs) <laughs> it was a horrible disco but when you have a horrible disco and then you put sheer heart attack on by Queen the entire place like empties and so that was the thing party killers songs that would kill the party basically they're all old songs from when we were kids that were in our little 45 box you know the B-sides the, the crazy stuff so it's the you know stuff like Fireball by Deep Purple Take Me Back Home by Slaves uh, Is There a Better Way by Slaves Quo Cockroach by The Sweets Right. There's even a David Bowie song in there, Hang On To Yourself. And, you know, it's it's infectious. You can hear that we're having a great time doing this. Well, and you didn't pick and all the... great o- companion to the regular. Yeah, you didn't pick all the obvious ones either. I mean, you've got Cheap Trick, He's a Whore in there. I mean, that's that's good stuff right there, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's plenty. There's, there's always great material out there. And like you say, people usually do the obvious stuff. But there's, there's stuff that, you know, that is just as good. <laughs> So it's it's an educational effort. <laughs> Here you go. It's it's your historical companion piece. So talk to us though about the new album, Extermination. What can we look forward to on that? Because Walk Through the Fire was a phenomenal album, like you said. What can we look forward to with the new one? Well, we basically just wanted to up our game and make stuff more powerful, have the sounds better, the sounds are bigger. I mean, I'm really amazed with the bass sound that was on walk through fire it's 10 times better on this the guitar sound is gigantic Joe's drum sound is just huge and the playing is a new it's upper level Mark's solos are just unbelievable on this record they're really really great um, yeah, the song structure we went for the riffs we went for the power the only time we've had that kind of leap in a sense is say from wiped out the all for one where we kind of like made things a little leaner and let the rips speak for themselves a little bit it's, you know it's not really the same but that's the only parallel I could really draw in that it's just very very powerful very heavy but very melodic so it's that blend that we always go for you know the, the, the chaos and the order and the melody and the lunacy balanced out just right and if everyone, if you want to check it out, go to kickstarter.com or go to ravenlunatics.com. There's a video up there, and you have me talking about it, and you can hear a few clips. I always wanted to ask you, because, you know, 
you come from that very simple school of you know the classic metal the the basis for all rock and roll but here you are you've always played you've had like a tremolo on your bass you play eight string bass 12 string bass that's certainly not traditional it's certainly not simplistic how did you get into doing all that uh basically a lot of the the local bands we saw everyone was just playing bass like the, your goldfish could play the bass lines you know especially when it, we morphed into a three piece it was a question of like well you know you've kind of got to do more to to fill the hole and when I was a kid I saw the sheep trick and saw the Tom playing the 12 string I thought wow I could do a lot of stuff on that you know the, I was lucky to get the second Ivan is eight string in England the first one was by Sting and then I got the first Kramer eight string after that which was my main bass for many years right um, you know I had it set so I could play it really fast main strings it just sounds huge with distortion on the tremolo was something I always wanted from day one and I finally browbeat a local luthier into making one for me and you know it stood me well all these years had that since 1980 it still kicks you know, I, I play with very light strings. I play a lot of crazy fast lines here and there. Not all the time, but where it's needed or where I can, where I can squeeze them in. And it's, you know, it's, it's just my style. I just come up with doing something maybe a little different. <laughs> well, for, for a lot of the newer fans that you're picking up, you're out on tour right now. The new album's coming out. There's there's a lot more internet interest people can can find out about a lot of the band because i talk to bands all the time and it's like they've heard of raven but never really heard raven because they're a lot younger but they're listening to a lot of that stuff again and just discovering bands like you so i'd like to sort of go back a little bit talk a little bit about the some of the history stuff i don't i know you guys obviously released rock until you drop but i had a few questions because 30 years ago you guys were you guys were touring hard 30 years ago in support of the seminal all for one album you released your first live record and everything can you take us back to recording that record and and give us maybe some some trivia fans might not be aware of a memory that stands out from from recording that album in that that period sure well we we done wiped out which was a concerted effort to be as fast and crazy as possible and we basically had enough for recording at neat records which is a small project studio you know next to our hometown the engineer was new and we basically pushed him to the limit and in the middle of doing this, we did a Radio 1 session down in London where we did four songs, and it was like, wow, this is a real studio with a real engineer, and we can get things done. And, you know, this sounds a thousand times better. So we had an older mate under the record company. We're not recording here. <clears throat> because, of course, it was a cheap outfit. They had an in-house studio. Why would they go anywhere else? We just said, no, we're not doing that. We're going to a real studio, and we want a real producer. And we checked out a lot of stuff, and one of our favorite records was Breaker by Accept, right. the German band. Loved that, and found out that the guy that really got all the sounds together was the engineer, a guy called Michael Wagner. And we said, all right, we want him. And it turned out that there was some friction with Accept, and Udo was contemplating a, a, a production gig, so he was working with Michael as a team, and we said, fine, bring them in. So we did pre-production, which is something we never really done before with anybody, because, you know, any other pre-production was done on the fly in the studio. So we worked for a week with the songs. He had great ideas and was thinking in the same direction. And then we went down to London, to a small studio called Pineapple, and went in there and, like, 16, 17 days, banged the whole thing out. And it was just awesome. We worked really hard and laughed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I remember we did the song uh, Ballad of Marshall Stack, which has these Indian rhythms. And at one point, Michael and Udo had their two-inch tape taped around their head and feathers stuck in the back of them and we were war dancing around the studio. You know? Nice. <laughs> when we were playing, we were dying laughing. We conned Udo into singing. So well, he's here, he's got to sing. We're going to do Born to be Wild. And we did our song Inquisitor as well. and That was a lot of fun. Yeah. The craziest version of Born to be Wild you'll ever hear. <laughs> yeah, you got Udo to do a couple of tracks on that. That was that was pretty classic. Some of my favorite stuff from going back and listening to the old albums, too. And and then, of course, you return the favor for bands that grew up and were inspired by you. 30 years later, you appeared on A Sound of Thunders Out of, Dark, Out of the Darkness album. Right. 
which was which was an amazing yeah. piece as well. So, no, it's always fun to do. Like I've, I've done a couple of things like that over the years. But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the thing with All for One was it, was it was we took everything to a different level as far as the you know we've been playing really fast and we kind of pared that down and went for power, which of course that kind of approach lends itself to playing larger places a little bit, you know, it's a little bit more instant. Sometimes the intricacies can get lost if you're playing them with a million watts in a huge place. So, you know, it was a big step for us as far as the sound and the songwriting. It's, you know, it's, it's one of our favorites, obviously. Right. You know, it's an interesting dynamic. You guys were a UK band and you re- and you transplanted to the States, but, you know, when 90s and grunge came along, the music scene in America, the rock metal scene pretty much died, but it kept thriving over in Europe. Did you guys ever consider moving back? Well, at that point, we basically, you know, had families and what have you, so no. I mean, we've been over for so long. You know, the usual horror stories of people living on 50 cents a month in England still continued, so... Besides, we like the weather better in the States. <laughs> it's always, you know, if you spend half your life waiting at the bus in the rain, being out in the sun is not a bad thing. <laughs> not a bad thing at all. I can't blame you. So, but we did do, we did obviously do a lot more work in Europe. Right. Uh, we just concentrated on Europe and Japan and kind of figured, well, this, this will either morph or it will blow over. And, of course, it kind of did both. Right. And... And, you know, things started getting better over here, and then there was, you know, other markets opening up. Gradually, it just got better here, but it, it was, you could kind of see it happening. It got to the point where it was just about, you know, it was like a big boil that was ready to pop. <laughs> 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 and it did. You know, we've been around doing this long enough, you know, it's cyclical. I mean, we had to deal with the punk thing when we were kids. Right. So. Raven has always been a part of my music scene, my education coming up, if you will. What was what was your scene like when you were coming up? Who helped form your rock and roll education? Well, pretty much we were very lucky. Uh, Newcastle and the northeast of England, I mean, none of the venues in England at that time were particularly huge outside of London, but nearly every band came and toured. So they'd play either the Mayfair Ballroom, which was a big club, calling about 1,500, 2,000 people, or the City Hall, which was a, you know, purpose-built like a classical hall, which held about maybe 2,000 people. So even if you were sitting at the back, you had a perfect view of what was going on. So our education was seeing Slade, Alex Harvey, Budgie, Rainbow, uh, Judas Priest, Pat Travers Band, Rory Gallagher, Status Quo, everyone that came by and you know there was no instructional videos and none of this stuff of course so you 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 watched and you listened right and you said wow this guy can play and this guy is boring and this guy is exciting and it was like well you know if you're going to play in the band what would you want to see and you know we that's why we started playing formed the band we wanted to jump around and make a noise Nice. And nobody jumps around and makes noises like we do. <laughs> <laughs> you guys just amped it up quite a bit. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, we were always drawn to the, the faster, crazier stuff. So, you know, things like the Montrose first album, Highway Star by Deep Purple, Exciter by Judas Priest, all those kind of things. You know? All right. So the last question before we get out of here, sort of our pointless question of the week. I've been asking a lot of people this lately because I'm sort of fascinated. You you read some of the histories of certain bands, and for whatever reason, there always seems to be some song that a band refuses to play anymore. They they like we wish we'd never recorded it. Is there any song in the Raven catalog that's like that that you're just sick of, or you wish you'd never recorded, or you just refuse to play anymore? Uh, well, anything that's like that, we've probably never played it from the get-go. So, <laughs> <laughs> none of the current songs we play, we'll ever get sick of. I don't think. It's uh, you know, there's, there's usually so much little intricacies or little spaces where you can play it a little differently and morph it around. But we took all for one out of the set for the first three shows of this tour, and we just said, you know what? Nah, put it back on. People like it too much. <laughs> um, we we have a lot of fun with it. I mean, this this songs like I mean the infamous Pack Is Back album. There's a couple of songs on there that will never see the light of day. But hey, that's just personal choice, you know. 
we pr- would prefer to look forward rather than look back. That's why on the tour right now we're playing two of the new songs, and the reaction to them both has been awesome at every show. Like you're playing that song, destroy all monsters. That's awesome, and you know, you, people are, when people are singing along with the chorus, the second time, you know, when you get round to the second time, they're already singing the chorus. You know, you're doing all right. Absolutely, and it's fantastic that you guys are doing that too, because so many bands now they'll be out on tour before the album comes out, and they refuse to play anything until something's been released. And it's like, man, yeah, that's... You, you can't. You, you've got to, you know, man. Again, it all kicks in with the whole thing of the band and the, the fans. You know, being one entity, we obviously want people to help out and contribute with a Kickstarter. What better than to say, hey, this is an idea of what you're going to be getting. Right. Uh, to, to hear it, you know, right there. That's the best advertisement you could ever have. And, and again, it's, it's rather than being, you know, really protective and holding on to everything. No, why not? Let's, let's put a little bit of something new out. It's been a long time, so it's, you know, we really need to do this. Absolutely. Well, it's exciting to hear. We're really looking forward to the new album, and the Party Killers thing is going to be fantastic, too. John Gallagher of Raven, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us. We're really looking forward to Extermination, Party Killers, seeing you out on tour. I'm sorry, I had to miss you. What can you do? The bus breaks down, shit happens, but it's great that you're still out there touring, and I can't thank you enough for 40 years of fantastic rock and roll. Thank you very much, and thanks to everyone out there for your support. We'll see you soon. Take care, brother.